Okay, I think we will get started. Um, I want to welcome folks to the Warden Eschirk Museum's virtual space. I'm Emily Zilber. I'm the Director of Curatorial Affairs and Strategic Partnerships here at the museum. We're really excited for you to join us for today's Creatives on Eschirk with Ginny Blanchard. First, um, I just want to note a couple of really exciting upcoming virtual and in-person programs that we have going on. Um, Ginny Virginia is with us today in part because she won the first place prize in our current in-person and virtual exhibition, Home as Self. That's our 28th annual juried woodworking exhibition. I really hope that you'll check out her work at WEM. We're really lucky to have it on site in the piece. Uh, in question is the image that you're seeing on your screen here. Um, and I ho also hope that you'll check out the work of everyone who was juried into the exhibition on our website. We have, um, uh, you know, a number of really, really wonderful artists and their words about uh, what makes these works that they've contributed to the exhibition a self-portrait to read there. We also have a really lovely catalog that can be downloaded for free or purchased as a hard copy. That's available on the website as well. Um, we hope that you'll join us for our next Spotlight Talk next week. That's August 23rd at noon. In keeping with the juried exhibitions focus this year on self-portraits, we're going to be looking more closely at, uh, I think, what, what folks might not think of as a self-portrait, but we're, we're sort of calling it that way, which is Asterix 1919 Coat Peg Portraits. So um, that explores the cast of characters, John Schmidt, Albert Culp, Aaron Coleman, Larry Hand, and Eshrick himself, and the role that they played in creating the iconic space of the workshop, workshop. So you can find information about upcoming virtual talks and recordings of past programs on our website. Um, I'm really pleased to welcome Ginny Blanchard to the, our, our Zoom room today. <laughs> Ginny is represented in the 28th annual juried exhibition by the piece that we're looking at here again, like the Virgin, which is this beautiful electrified straw marquetry mirror that speaks to themes of unexpected loss, uh, how we look at ourselves through the eyes of others who may see us differently than we see ourselves. It also marries Ginny's skill and interest in decorative arts and traditional woodworking practices with other influences, including her study of historic Russian iconography. There's a lot of different things in the mix here, which is so exciting. Um, Ginny is a designer maker of custom commissioned furniture and smaller batch goods. Her influences, again, are primarily from late 19th through early 20th century European decorative arts, as well as abstracted natural forms. She primarily works with wood, straw, and reed, and has a focus on marquetry and inlay. She grew up in Pelham, New York, and after earning her BA in Russian from New York University, she went on to study woodworking at the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship in Rockport, Maine, and she now lives in Midcoast, Maine, designing and building furniture out of her 1848 ship's captain's home, which she will be, and, and I'm using her words here, lovingly restoring for the rest of her natural life. Uh, and Jenny shares her home, again, in her words, with two excellent shelter mutts who are no help at all. So I know Ginny is coming to us today from her home, so maybe we'll get a, a peek of those mutts if we're lucky. Uh, Ginny and I will speak for about 30 to 40 minutes today, and we'll have some time after that for any questions. You're also encouraged to put any questions that you might have in the chat throughout the talk, um, and if somebody can answer them ahead of the Q&A time, I have my colleagues from the museum here um, who are sort of watching that chat, uh, but also, you know, we'll get to them at the end if there's something that's that's directly for Ginny. Um, if you're not already muted, I will also ask you to go ahead and do so before we get started. So without further ado, Ginny, welcome to the Wharton Eshrick Museum's virtual stage. Um, thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I want to congratulate you first off on winning the top prize in this year's juried exhibition. And I'd love to really start off with a close look at like the Virgin, the, the mirror that we're looking at here. Um, you know, can you give us uh, the, the full overview of the work and your thinking in making it? Sure. Um, I had been making 
kind of like what you see in the halo there, lights and sconces backed with the straw marquetry um, and it incorporated into to mirrors as well. And she's prototyping that. When I saw the call for entries, um, which I think I saw a couple times before I actually decided to enter with not a huge amount of time available to design and build something. Um, but it, it occurred to me that I could make something like this piece. Um, so I wrote in my, my, in retrospect, very sad little artist statement. It wasn't, I wasn't doing great. Um, so, you know, this was a very aspirational kind of to take this concept that I was already working within and, um, and make myself look like a, a, a glowing icon <laughs> to, help, to help with confidence and, and feeling better and just mostly kind of as a funny joke. Um, and that's how I ended up with this idea of, of, of transforming my little marquetry backed light surface into a halo and giving it the triptych and then the, the blue bottom because you know you see Mary in iconography she often has these big glowing blue robes um because that was the color associated with you know royalty and empire and 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 her leadership in the in the church um so that's how I got there and you know, I'm curious because it's had this like public life and in, in ways now that it doesn't sound like you might have anticipated <laughs> when you were, um, you know, working on the piece or putting it together. I'm curious if um, there have been any new meanings or ideas or, or things that you've learned about the piece as it's sort of been out there in the world and, and seen a little bit by, by folks. I mean, apart from the fact that now it just, uh, you know, looks looks a little bit more boring and workaday to me because I've seen it a bunch of times. But uh, <laughs> but but no, I mean, I think it, I think it was pretty pretty straightforward in 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 the concept I was going for. Well, I have to say that that sort of from from our view at the museum, people do come into the visitor center um, and are drawn to it immediately and really remark about um, how they feel when they look in the mirror, that they do feel a different way. They feel sort of bolstered and and um, uh, there's a sort of joyous uh, engagement with it. So um, that's yeah, that's, that's the idea. <laughs> so it's doing the thing that you hoped it would do, which is great. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'd love to take a, a little bit of a step backwards, right? You had mentioned the, the sort of uh, Mary iconography, the religious iconography, and I know you have this deep knowledge of Russian history, literature, and art, having studied that. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what was so exciting to you or interesting to you about that part of the world, about, about Russian art and literature and, and the sort of creative production of, of Russia. So, I mean, you know, a deep knowledge might be a little hyperbolic. Just, <laughs> deeper, an... deeper, deeper knowledge than I do. So you get to have yeah. deep knowledge. <laughs> You've got bachelor's degrees for anything. Um, <laughs> I, I, so I got into that kind of, it's a, a going to have a lame answer and it's just because I went to liberal arts school and I had to pick something. Mm. Um, I had kind of dreams in my heart when I was like a teenager of doing sort of things that required more specific schooling. Like I wanted to be an engineer for a long time, but I also wanted to have fun and that's not compatible when you're 17 to go to engineering school and have a good time. Um, I wanted to be an architect for various reasons that didn't work out. Um, so I ended up just going to college um, and I picked Russian because I was particularly into Dostoevsky at the time, and I mm. still am. Um, so it's not really, I mean, Russian aesthetics, it's not really what they're, what they're known for. I'll, I'll leave it at that so it's not to offend anybody if they happen to really be into Russian art. Um, but yeah, it was the literature um, and, and, and music as well. I was a, a, like a halfway decent classical pianist as a kid. Mm. Um, and so I got into also, you know, Rachmaninoff's my favorite composer, and I just, um, they're, they're, they do certain things very well, like with the, in, in music, like the highs are really highs, and there's like these big, you know, triumphant, just like super speak to the soul joyous moments, where you just forget to breathe sometimes, and these like Tchaikovsky concertos and things. Mm. 
Um, and I think the same thing is true in the literature. There's a lot of a lot of high highs, and then I guess you know Dostoevsky gets the reputation, perhaps simplistically and unfairly, of being depressing. Um, but there are moments where you kind of like want to stab yourself in the neck, and that's part of the whole, you know, human experience. It's it's, it's they do a good job at at being very emotive. Um, mm. So that's why I just selected that random path to go down, which nowadays makes me feel a little bit like a war criminal, but I know that's not logical. Um, yeah, and, and, and you know, so obviously I'm familiar with the with icons and iconography and had a chance to go visit um, back in, when I was in college at some point, my brother was living there. So I got to see a lot of that firsthand. Which is mm. That opportunity is probably not gonna come up anytime soon again. Um, yeah, that was, that was my, my, my journey through, through Russian lit and studies. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in, in hearing that, that notion of these like emotional extremes, right? We're going to get all of the things that life has to offer yeah. <laughs> and we're going to delve deeply into it. And, um, uh, it's, it's so interesting to me tying that back to this piece, right? Where you're, you're, it has this explicitly emotional tie to it and how you transition, um, from maybe a low low to if not a high high some other sort of pull on the emotional <laughs> spectrum <laughs> um uh, through through being seen or being seen differently or through the way that that you're reflected um whether that's we're talking about the reflection in the glass or or the reflection of light that sort of frames things and i'm curious if you can talk about you know that that notion of like emotional polarity and and whether you see those ties as well i guess that's you know i i, I usually think of like the the decorative arts and, and visual art i mean maybe the fine arts not so much but as, as less kind of the emotive arts, mm. have like music and those things and then but i guess but your but your point is correct and i guess that's why we all get into decorative arts is because they do make you feel a certain way within your surroundings and your home and um yeah usually i think of that more as like a as a mental problem to be solved but yeah wasn't yeah i think i mean it's to me i look at this and i'm seeing something that's like the embodied version of that right like how do those feelings exist in the body and you just what you described so beautifully when you were talking about what drew you to Rachmaninoff, what drew you to Dostoevsky? What drew you to these sort of descriptors of, of you know, what it means to have a high human experience and what it means to have a low human experience, which, um, you know, not only are we all, do we all engage with, but I think artists engage with and, and makers engage with um, in their own particular kinds of ways, right? Both in the process of the making and in the conceptualization of the pieces. You're opening my eyes to my own work. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> my it's my my take, but it might not be might not be accurate. Might not be everybody's. I mean, I'm I'm curious if you can can share a little bit about how you get from those notions of high and low to, you know, woodworking and furniture making more broadly. Where how do you get from Dostoevsky to to straw marquetry? <laughs> in, in three easy steps. <laughs> a long, circuitous road of, of <laughs> disappointments and some triumphs. Some, um, how did I get into just generally into making? Yeah, how did how did how did woodworking how did wood and furniture making find you? Um, I think so. I, I I still kind of liked the idea. The reason I didn't end up pursuing architecture, I think, is because. Um, I interned at an architect because I thought that's I feel like everybody kind of secretly wants to be an architect. Um, but I so I took that step. Um, and it was it was great. It was a wonderful experience. But it was for me a lot of kind of sitting in front of a computer like a office job on CAD. Mm -hmm. And as you've seen with my computer skills, that's not really <laughs> the, the track for me. Um, and you know, and if 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 you're not one of the most celebrated architects in the world, you have a lot of constraints all the time. Um, so I think halfway through college, getting my Russian degree, that was just something I picked for fun. Um, I thought about furniture as 
kind of fulfilling a lot of the things that architecture does or like I, I like just math and problem solving and spatial puzzles and all of that. Um, but also, you know, getting to kind of build your own environment um, as, as you do in architecture, you do also in furniture. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't have, well, first of all, it's just very tactile and not a computer unless you design things on CAD, I don't, but you can pretty much just be in a shop like a Luddite, which really appealed to me. Um, and you and you can, you know, more or less do what you want. Obviously, if you have commissions that have restraints, but you can also make spec work, which you can't do in architecture. Um, you know, supplies aren't cheap, but they're not prohibitively expensive either. Um, so that was, I think I just decided at some point that I would want to try that out. And then I went up to the school in Maine after I graduated and I liked it very well. And I was all right at it, which I thought I might be because I was always the one in our apartments in college fixing everybody else's stuff, <laughs> building little makeshift furniture. Um, so yeah, and I stuck with it. And that was how I got there. And the straw marketry came very, very recently. Um, but I guess I started making furniture more than 10 years ago at this point. Hmm. So, you know, messed around with different, different techniques and materials along the way. And, I, and I'm curious if you, do you remember what one of the first sort of projects or pieces that you made when you got to the center was that sort of helped things click in your mind that said, okay, this is it for me. This is, this is it. Um, let's see, one of the first things I've made there um, was in a shorter kind of course. And we all had to make like a cabinet of some sort. It had to have like doors and drawers just to sort out how to do how to do joinery and all that. Um, and I really, I really shot for the fences. Um, and I didn't finish the project, but I got good feedback on the yeah. one throughout it. <laughs> and I think getting getting good feedback from people who actually know what they're doing and people who have been in it for a while is uh, is important to not to, to pursuing anything, right? To mm -hmm. feel like you have a, a chance um, and not being a total hack. So that would have been my, my failed cabinet would have been probably the first thing that was of some importance to me that I made there. Yeah. I, I love, uh, honestly, start, starting out with a, with a, with a well-regarded failure feels like a really <laughs> lovely and fortuitous way to get, to get on the road. Here, because it puts you right in that place of like process rather than product, which, mm -hmm. um, you know, is where so much of like the learning and the yeah. engagement sounds like it happens for you, right? It's not about designing the thing and then it gets realized it's about the work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, hitting a few things, hitting a few nails on the head. If not, you know, at that early stage, it was, that's important, that's good, that was good feedback. Do you, do you still have your failed cabinet? It's, I don't have it in my house, but it's in my mother's garage. And I feel like, just nobody wants to be the one that finally throws it in the garbage <laughs> one day, but just, I don't really want to do it. She doesn't really want to do it. So yes, it still exists in the world. Or maybe one day I'll just finish it. Another, that would be interesting, right? Ten year to come come back now, ten years later with all yeah. you've learned and <laughs> hate it. really hate it in my in my heart, but I had to do it. That's a possible path. Well, I'm I'm curious, you know. So you've made that you made this sort of leap from literature, from from um, music to furniture, and and you know you're a person who's working in the 21st century, working with the tools and sort of spaces that you have available to you, but also still really interested in historic decorative arts, historic making, late 19th, early 20th century work. Um, and I'm curious, what about that time period or moment is interesting to you and whether there are works of art, objects, practices that you find meaningful um, in particular? Um, yeah, so that particular, I mean, I, you know, because I like it is probably a bad answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's, it's the most important answer in some way, right? <laughs> That's what I like. Um, but it, it, that whole, like, like I'll show, let's see, I'll show the uh, own of course now this is gonna give out on me. Um, like the secessionist building is a good good example. That 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 time period around, and this this building was actually way earlier than it, it always surprises me. This was built in 1898. Mm -hmm. um, it just feels really modern, everything in that 
period to me, even now more than a hundred years later, for me, that's just kind of like what modernity looks like. And that was the point back then. It was like, they were, you know, the, the prevailing style when this was built was Beaux-Arts where everything was still very kind of heavily ornamented with kind of like literal, you know, busts and acanthus leaves and all these, these, you know, a lot of egg and dart going on. Um, but this, I mean, it makes sense for what's happening in the world. You know, everything was kind of like coming apart and rearranging itself. And, you know, you had these expositions where everybody kind of got together and people were stealing and borrowing from Japan and other places that they didn't really like have a lot of access to before. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's just, it, 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 they were kind of starting fresh and I think it shows and it looks that way to me and it feels that way to me. Um, and they were doing all these really naturalized forms. And I mm. think, it, you know, there's the industrial, everything was getting hyper-industrialized kind of very quickly. And so there are all these kind of art hippies that want to do this back to nature thing. So you have the secessionism in, uh, in, in kind of Austria. I think it was still Austria Hungary at that point, right? Yeah, until the First World War. Um, you know, you have Emile Gallet and all these guys in the sea, and then you have the British doing their arts and crafts. And it was all this kind of idea of, you know, the, the, the dignified labor of one person going back into their shop and mm. doing the work and, you know, that was the arts and crafts movement. And then so incorporating all these natural, they were the hippie dippies of their day of, of to get away <laughs> what kind of smoggy industrialized environment they were all living in. Um, but then, you know, from that, even in 1900, so you have, so I like, you know, you have the kind of big laurel ball up top that's on the top of the building, which is a lot more, I guess, realistic. Um, and then, you know, when you come down to the sides, it always almost becomes this kind of line drawing, hmm. that same where they just keep kind of pulling away elements until it just becomes super stylized. Um, and I like, and I, I, I kind of do that sometimes and steal from them in that way. Um, and I just think it's very, very appealing. And I think nature is a good designer. So to, to steal from it, um, you know, it's all right. This actually, this exact design, I made a, well, I hand drew it, but I made a stencil up and did my little powder room and all these, uh, these laurel designs from the secession building. Cause you're going to have fun in one room in the house and the, the powder room is the place to do it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so they did, they have, I'll, I'll bring out my, my analog gigantic book, um, for a couple more little items like that. And, you know, and this was, um, so some of the guys that work on this building, like Colin Moser worked on the secession building. And he mm -hmm. went on later to found the Beiner Berkstede with Joseph Hoffman and a bunch of other people. Um, and they did, and this is sort of like, this kind of reminds me of Escherich and his half too, with his like, what you're talking about with the little hanging pegs at the beginning of this thing. Everything in, in, in the house and the homes they did was designed, like from mm -hmm. they designed the woman's clothing who would be living in the house. Um, and I like that idea. So there's some cutesy little, you know, here's a little Coleman Moser, little sugar chest, which, you know, is, is probably like gratuitously precious and fancy for a place to hold your sugar. Um, but, you know, I think I've ripped off this, this motif, this another floral that's been hyper stylized again. Mm -hmm. I have, I used that in my, uh, Let's see. In this piece, I kind of kind of went with that. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's interesting. This this abstracted nature, right, is something that really ties your influences and your own contemporary practice and Eshrick together. Because of course, you know, Eshrick, um, uh, we we have this sort of engagement with nature that ranges from sort of more. Um, iconographic depictions at the beginning of his career to um, this lifelong interest in sort of the way that things grow in nature, right? That that sort of spiralic upward movement that plants make or and that bodies make. So um, I see that as sort of linking the two of you across time and now, of course, here back to, uh, uh, you know, the Wiener Werkstätte and arts and crafts and all of these other um, sort of movements that, you know, were organic and interested in um, uh, organic form in, in ways that are sort of prescient for, for the ways that a lot of people are working today. I mean, I'm curious how you might see nature showing up in your work, not just as a motif, but, but perhaps in other ways and 
you know, whether, whether you think your relationship with nature is sort of, is it a partnership? Is it some other kind of relationship? What, what does that look like? Oh, I'd like to like, you know, pretend I live a more lower Englishy life than I do and that I would go out <laughs> and my own trees and, you know, and, and really start from there and be, and be one with the whole process. Um, maybe in future, I'm not quite there yet. Um, but I think to, to be a maker of any, any, any maker has, has that kind of, I assume we all get some satisfaction out of taking raw materials and building things we need. And that's kind of what human beings were supposed to be doing, right? Mm. So I, I think there's a good, you do feel like part of the of, of a system that's that's supposed to work this way, I guess. Um, yeah, but is that is that is that an appropriate answer? I mean, there's no such thing, right? It's only <laughs> the, the true answer, right? <laughs> the answer that okay. works for you, right? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested, um, I know that you had talked a little bit in our, at the opening about um, growing and, and working with straw in different kinds of ways. And so I certainly see that as, as a way of engaging with nature that is, is particular. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that. I did try to grow my own furniture. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I planted a section of my vegetable garden, for those who didn't see that talk, with, um, with winter rye last fall. And I thought I was being very clever and subverting the system. And, you know, I'm gonna really, really go off the grid and not have packages shipped to me from California anymore. Um, I think in future, I will leave, like I'll, I'll stick with the vegetable gardening and leave the crop growing to professional farmers. Mm. It seems like more, he's going to scratch my rug. Hey, incorrect. Um, it seems like more of a pain than it's, than it's worth for me, a person who does not professionally harvest straw. <laughs> it was a fun experiment. I'm glad, I'm glad I did it. Did um, you learn anything about the material from growing it yourself? No, I don't think it taught me any good lessons. <laughs> I think it mostly just took up room that I would otherwise have like planted with more lettuces. Um, I know. I mean, you know, yeah, it was, it was a fun experiment. I think, I think, I think that chapter's closed. Yeah, ne next, next, next time it will just be more salad. <laughs> yeah. And I'll move on. You know, I have, um, I have ambitions in future to to do a little main camp out in the woods and maybe. Mm. Then start actually felling my trees and, and building my own little coat pegs with them and feel really start to finish like I'm a like I'm a yeah proper human being that just that just lives in the woods. <laughs> I like that proper human being that just lives lives in the woods, right? It's <laughs> like <laughs> Well, so I'm, I'm curious about when you might have first encountered Escherich's work um, and what it was about the work that, that interested you. Was this something that happened while you were at the center during your own sort of study or, um, yeah, how did Escherich come onto your path? It was, it was, um, I was in the, the, the fellows building at the, at the center um, and somebody had a book or the book just lived there. I don't know. It was about... Um, the homes and shops of Sam Maloof, George Nakashima, and Horton Escherich. Mm. That was that was the theme of the book. And so I flipped through. And while Sam Maloof and George Nakashima have very cool homes and studios, um, I did was most drawn to Escherich just because it was that kind of. I was more into kind of the the kind of flowy Art Nouveau back then than mm. kind of Jungian Steely thing that I like now. Like almost into into Deco in my new projects. Um, so he does that, like his house is that kind of like free for me, you know, it's very kind of flowing and undulating in the spaces, just kind of, uh, you know, it's not super strict. Um, and also that, that, you know, there were pictures of his hardware in the book that he really made and went through and did all the elements and they were all kind of designed as part of a whole work. And that again, relates a lot to the, the Art Nouveau guys. They were all, all doing that where every, every kind of piece was part of the whole. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The long German word for it. Gesamtkunstwerk. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it very much has, has that kind of um, vibe to it in, in, yeah. my, in my looking at it. No, it's we we talk about the studio a lot as a, as, a, as a sort of total work of art. And it reminds me of, um, and I think maybe as a, as a, as a, 
almost architect. Um, it reminds me of, of something that the, the Finnish architect Eliel Saarinen said about how architecture is everything from the city plan to the cigarette case, right? So really that whole scope <laughs> of um, uh, everything from the structure of the building itself to what's in it to the designs on the things that are, that are small um, uh, and, and components of it. I think there's definitely an affinity there. You know, I know you had a chance to visit the studio space when you dropped off the work for this uh, exhibition. And I'm curious if seeing Escherich's work sort of in the context of seeing the studio space has made an, an impact on your understanding of him or yourself as an artist and whether there are spaces in the studio that, that are particularly meaningful to you. Yeah, um, so there were there was a couple of, well, I mean, I think, the whole, so like I, I have this picture of the, the dining room and I, when Sophie was giving me the tour, she said something about the floor, a friend of his had given him some off cuts. Is that the story or something? Like his, his, the, 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 the wood supplier that he worked with, Ed Ray, who, who sort of logged the mountain around um, and yes, yeah, was, was made those available to Eshrick, uh <laughs> sort of to see if he could do anything with them. <laughs> and then he made this, I mean, I remarked on it, that was, you know, one of the first things you noticed because it's very just neat to look at. And and Sophie told me that story and it's just like him kind of being petty almost, which I like. And the whole house has a really good sense of humor, I think, which is, I, I feel like most furniture makers have that a little bit. There, there's, there's a little bit of laughing at yourself. Um, which is good. I mean, he's like a very celebrated and important American furniture maker, but a, a lot of the house is 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 fun. I mean, it, it, he's having he's having he's not taking himself too seriously in this very kind of serious pursuit of of you know making things and making his own home. Um, so I like that the dining room floor very much. I thought that was cute. I think everybody likes a kitchen just because it's the ultimate little problem solving mm. puzzle where you just have to kind of in a very small space, find a place for all these things that have to be in a certain place or else the kitchen just doesn't function properly. Um, so that was very neat. Um, yeah, the whole the whole thing was really, it was, it was, I'm, I'm glad I got the opportunity to come down and, and take a tour. Mm. It's excellent. Yeah, and did it, did it change your understanding of him? Uh, was it just the, the sort of humor or, or, um, you know, did did being there sort of change your understanding of any of the the works that had been of interest to you before coming? I don't think it changed my understanding of any of his yeah. him or his work. Um, I do. I think uh, you know the fact that he built it in stages um, mm -hmm. is sort of I think admirable and surprising to me, just because I'm such a, a, a lunatic nut that you know you have to everything has to be kind of planned out ahead of time. And I thought, well, I guess I know other furniture makers that kind of fly by the seat of their pants as well. Um, but yeah, that was interesting to think about. You know, you've built this this thing, you've spent a lot of time and energy, and and then you blow out a wall to add some new kind of piece to attach to the side. Um, so good for him. I don't I don't know if I'd have the the chutzpah to to do that. I mean, it's it's you say that, but also I'm thinking of this. You know ship captain's home right that you've purchased in Maine this 19th century home mm -hmm. and um the fact that you share in your bio that you're going to be lovingly restoring it for the rest of your your life mm -hmm. um and so I'm curious you know how does that planning impulse connect to knowing that you have this home space that you're going to be devoting this time and energy to and then um you know, how did, how did you come to have this relationship with the house and what's, yeah, satisfying or challenging about shaping it to be yours? Well, I'm not tearing down any of the walls. No new, okay. no new walls. No, it, it is what it is. Um, it's all very satisfying and all very challenging. So um, the I mean, the, the thing I liked about the house when I bought it ages ago um, was that it was, it was like a little bit of a wreck when I bought it, but they hadn't kind of ripped any of, it was kind of as is, it's very original to what it was built like. Um, I think, you know, the last big projects were done in like 1890. So, mm. um, so I liked it for that reason, but yeah, it's just, it's, you know, as anybody that has an old decrepit house knows, it's a ton of work. There was no room that was just fine. Um, 
And the big challenge of this house, which I think I, I drew a little inspiration from Escher, Escher's house, um, it's a really difficult house to put furniture in, which mm. for who makes furniture is kind of an interesting problem to have because there's no, everything either has doors or windows or radiators. There's nowhere to put anything. So I have um, kind of gone in and out of chickening out of just building kind of weird built-ins that fit what's here. Um, and yeah, I think I think like a house like Escherich's house where you just have things that you have to just start making part of the house. And then, and you know, and then when I drop dead one day and somebody else comes in wants to live in the house, they could take, take out what I've done and still have the original intact. It's kind of the dream in my heart. Um, mm. But yeah, I'll, I'm gonna, I'll make some bolder moves in the future for sure of, of making it more mine. Because I do like an old house. Um, I like old furniture, but yeah, there are, there are some, some touches of my own stuff I would like to put in and will and, and have and, you know, an endless project. But yeah, it's great. <laughs> you're finally done with a room and you don't hate being in there and that feels, that feels wonderful. Okay, so you don't hate being in there. We're keeping no. the bar. <laughs> no, I've gotten got to the point right now. I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly happy in here, but yes, I still have a, probably a good like 80 years of work to do. Okay. Before, before it's like before I have to go and start over the last thing I did that I don't like anymore. It's good you've got your marching orders right ahead of you. <laughs> Board days ahead. I mean, I'm curious if having to think about designing furniture for this very particular home or sort of how you put furniture in the home has actually um, trickled into the work that you do for other people. I don't know about that. I think everybody comes to with their own kind of sets of challenges. I guess, you know, any problem you solve is you, you get better at problem solving generally. Mm -hmm. So yeah, when there's, there's certainly been certain things I've had to make that were, they were kind of head scratchers. Um, yeah. But I think with other people's stuff, it's, it's kind of easier in a way because they have already their own style and orders and, and, and objectives they need to, to meet with whatever you're making them. And yeah, I, I having your, having own house where there's no real schedule or timeline or you can kind of have more fun. It's almost more of a challenging, you know, design wise. Mm. And, and so you, you feel sort of a sense of comfort when you're working on something for a client at being able to sort of take a step back because you have these other outlets. Am I hearing that correctly? Or um, yeah, what is it about working with, with clients and designing for them that feels easier? Just that the, the, the parameters are kind of known, right? Yeah. You know what they're asking for, you know how they want it to work, you know about how they want it to look. Um, yeah. Whereas if it's, you know, for yourself or for your own home, you can go a thousand ways to Sunday with any given problem and you know, sort that out. You can, you can wake up in the mid sixties and decide you want to put a silo on the barn that you exactly. built for the first time in 1926, right? right. The world is oyster, <laughs> which is a challenging thing sometimes. <laughs> when everything's available to you. Yeah. Silo included. <laughs> well, so, you know, I'm, I'm curious if you can share a little bit with us about um, like what's most exciting to you in your work right now? Right now I'm kind of in like a, a, a burn it all down phase. Okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> like it's like a whole new world out there. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, like on, in terms of, you know, personal home projects where I can really do whatever I'd like. Um, I think I'm 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 starting to kind of pare things down a little bit, mm -hmm. which is exciting in its own in its own right. I think I've in the past I've done a lot of I don't want to say decorations. I feel like that's almost an insult, but um, but it's been a lot going on and like a little mm -hmm. bit gaudy, but on purpose. Like I'm self-aware. I know, you know, there's been a lot a lot of little details and stuff. Um, so yeah, and then in the next couple of things I have going on, um, I'm pulling it back a little bit, working more with a straw. Okay. Um, that's sort of the element of like the wow element, because it definitely has that. And um, yeah, I'm excited about it. And I'm curious, what do you know what form it's gonna do you know what form it's gonna take? Are there particular sort of forms that you're excited about working with where you get to bring that that sort of paired back 
con sort of uh, design, but also it sounds like high drama um, of the way that you're thinking, you know, about light and, and like reflection. For particular projects? Yeah, I'm, I, are there particular forms or particular um, pieces of furniture that you're, you're most excited about engaging with right now? For my own um, fun stuff, I, I have been threatening to make myself um, a bed for ages. Okay. I think I'm finally going to take that on and it is going to be kind of simple and boxy in form. Um, but having, I'm going to incorporate lights into it again, mm -hmm. so that they're just there. I think, and maybe that has to do with the fact that there's not a lot of places to put furniture in my house. It's just going to be one big piece of furniture where the side tables are built in, the chest for linens at the base is built in, the lights are built in, <laughs> and, this is, and this is how we solve problems. I was gonna say this is this is this is like part bed, part sort of <laughs> like yep. spaceship, right? Exactly. <laughs> multi multi piece transformer. <laughs> but in doing that, when you have all those kind of like massing problems to solve, I guess because you know mm. you have different bits and bops, um, and that becomes more of where you focus the design rather than you know what the veneer on it looks like. Mm. Um, like another, I have a picture here of, yeah. So like um, one of my little favorite things back from the Weiner Bergstätte was like Colin Moser, he did these uh, writing cabinets, mm -hmm. the whole thing, like the chairs, it's like one mass. And then he just puts in these beautiful veneer work. Um, and I kind of did a lot of stuff like that for a long time and I like it and I'll probably still do it. Um, but yeah, this is a whole new, whole new problem. And so when you when you start on something like this, um, how do you how do you get started? Do you are you writing? Are you drawing? Are you looking at references? Are you just spending a lot of time staring into space, which I know is like really good <laughs> productive time for a lot of people? Are you tinkering with materials? What is what does starting a project like this look like for you? A lot of staring into space. Um, <laughs> no, mo mostly drawings. I'll just sit around and draw a lot and then yeah mm -hmm. and then there's always the time where you make a final drawing and then you change everything and it's like you just drew all those lines for no reason whatsoever um but yeah um just a bunch of drawings and are those drawings ever things you share with people or do they feel like they're personal yeah i actually i really like how the like drawings look when you're done with a project and you have like mm. notes on it and your little trigonometry and sections and just little kind of detail drawings of certain elements i love i think i think those are great if, if it didn't feel like a, a jerky move i would probably frame them and put them around <laughs> I'm just drawing like crappy hey enough to have just bad drawings around the house seems seems goofy but yeah no i love that is there a drawing for the mirror that's a part of the show yes of course there's many drawings there's bad drawings, mm. there's drawings there's yeah there's color drawings I would love to see, I would, I'm going to put you on the spot, but I would love to see, I would love to see them. And I bet um, if you have one that's shareable, I bet folks who, one who are done in the talk. Porn, but if I go to get it, I'm sure I will lose the internet. Well, so what we'll do is if you're willing to share it, we can send it as a follow, as a part of the follow-up email. Cause I think that's so interesting seeing the process and also knowing that, you know, you're inspired by these um, sort of art movements that are so heavily graphic and that really like bridge this space between two dimensions and three dimensions in a way that I also think is very fundamentally connected to Eshrick, who is somebody who starts out in two dimensions, gradually makes his way into three dimensions, but always thinks um, with this real attention to surface and how you abstract form and what it what you can say when you are working in two dimensions versus what it means to say something working in space um so i think that would be a lovely a lovely coda and a lovely treat to to folks who attended the program today if we can share that with them i feel like the mirror is probably less interesting than most of them because it already is essentially a 2 two <laughs> But yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to send them along, whatever I find. I know the, the big ones on the wall in the shop, but there's probably some other ones as well. Well, if you find something that's more interesting, we'd love to see that too. I think, um, you know, I'll I'll speak for for myself and for for the other folks on the program today. That I think we're excited to see what you what you do next, and really grateful that you shared this time and so much of yourself and your your practice with us. Um, and uh, I don't know about the rest of the rest of the folks here, but I'm I'm like ready to head back and look at my my Vienna. <laughs> 
my Vienna trip pictures from like six or seven years ago and just mm -hmm. submerse myself in, a, in that moment. So thank you so much, Jenny. This is really wonderful. Um, I want to, you know, just let everyone know we have um, a couple of minutes for, for questions. I know we have a question here from Stephen in the chat, so we can start with that. And then we'll probably have time for another question or two. We're a small enough group. So um, if after, after this is finished, if somebody wants to unmute and just ask the question, please feel free and go ahead, or you can put it in the chat and we can, we can get it that way. So Stephen asked here, um, similarly to Art Nouveau or the arts and crafts movement, do you think you've been pushing against the world of CNC and computer designed furniture as they reacted to industrialization? I am laughing because when I started making furniture, I was sure that I was just going to like hand mill everything. Like, <laughs> and I was never, and now the other day I bought a domino and that was just like the, the, the final <laughs> to my like uh, yeah, I, I, when I was building my shop out in my barn, which I started during COVID, um, so like two years ago, uh, yeah, I, 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 there's a router table in there. But yes, when I, when I began, I thought, right, I was going to like just commune with nature and just be in there all day with just like shavings everywhere. And I guess I am still just like a mask on. Um, but but that but that dream failed me, or I failed that dream. I guess is the right is the right way to put it. Or or maybe that dream wasn't such a dream. It was a fiction and not a dream, right? <laughs> yeah. Maybe maybe the dream needs tweaking, not your practice. There we go. <laughs> so yes, there was that impulse, one hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering about your marquetry and if that is like stemming from your love to draw or if it's the technique that you like or if it's like the puzzle problem solving elements or like what led you to be so deep into marquetry. I think all of the above, I guess. Um, <laughs> I think part of it is like that really kind of, so it's, it's, I've, I've never really a big, when you say my love to draw, I guess I, I do draw a bit and like it, um, but I never considered myself like a, like a proper fine artist, but like with these more kind of geomet geometric and graphic and stylized things, I guess I do really like, like that, that 2D element of things and 2D design. Um, and then I do, I like any process where you kind of get into that little like zen out to sitting there and, and doing the repetitive. I do, I, as a process, I like that a lot. I think that's, that's a fun way to work. And then all of a sudden, like eight hours later, you're just done and it's, <laughs> where did this come from? Um, so yeah, there's a lot to like about it. That meditative quality, right, of being able yeah. to turn off the 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 one part of your brain and just just be in flow with another part. Yeah. <laughs> Draw lines and saw them. Seems very the world is simple at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have time for one last question. If anyone else has one. And if not, I want to just say thank you again, Virginia, for taking the time to, to spend with us today. We're so thrilled to have your piece at the museum. Really thrilled that you are a part now of um, the Wharton Escherich Museum, sort of uh, juried exhibition history, right? And we get to share your work with, with our audiences um, and really hope that, that you'll stay connected with us even once the show is over. We really appreciate you, you being with us today. Yeah, I was, um, I'm happy to, to do it. Um, I'm glad, I'm glad that people, people like the, like the piece when they come in. Yeah, it's been happy, it's been happy to engage. And so, um, you know, folks will be sending out a, um, uh, a sort of follow up with some links. I think since uh, Virginia showed us, Jenny showed us some some really wonderful pictures. We'll try to get some of the pictures of the Coleman Moser pieces and 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 things there um, as a part of the follow up if we can. And um, you know, if folks feel like unmuting themselves to just wave goodbye. Uh, that's sort of become our little Wharton Escherich Museum tradition. And we will see you at the next program. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.